Got a couple more minutes and I'll take a cue from, uh, from Sherry and from Jackie. If we're good to go, we are right at 7.30 right now. Uh, it doesn't look like we have too many others in the waiting room just now. So I think we'll go ahead and start by saying, first of all, welcome and Chag Sameach. This uh, Shavuot is, has always been one of my favorite holidays uh, ever since I first learned of its existence which admittedly was not until I was probably about uh, 14 or 15. Um, it was not something that I learned about immediately in religious school, uh, since it is a holiday that often falls after the end of the religious school, school year. Uh, so it's not one that always gets quite as much play. Give me one moment, I'm gonna shut my door so that there's not an echo from downstairs. I see we still have a few others coming in, so I won't uh, get us started on the screen share just yet, but I'll still say welcome and Chag Tameach. So good to see everyone. Oh, my family joined, <laughs> and my in-laws too. Glad to see we get some early Shavuot learning all the way for all around Indianapolis, all the way out to California, San Diego, and LA. They're here, hello, <laughs> welcome. You guys have a few more hours until Chag begins, but I'm glad to welcome you to start it with us too. <laughs> <laughs> we have the sunshine uh, in San Diego there, Maria. Okay, so I, while we're still waiting for any others, I'm gonna at least start, I'm gonna be doing my guide through what we're learning a little bit tonight from a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing that and it'll have a couple of instructions for how to get all of us off of your screen if we are in fact there. So let me go ahead and start that. And let's make sure, get this into presentation mode. Can you all see the full screen of the presentation nods or thumbs up? Okay, so if we are all on your screen and blocking what you can see, I've got here how to go ahead and clear that out of your way, depending on what kind of device you are using. So if you are using a computer and our faces are blocking your view, or I am blocking your view if you have just the speaker mode turned on, just at the very top of your screen, if you're using a computer, there's a green bar that should say something along the lines of you are viewing Rabbi Jenny's screen. And next to it, there should be a drop down menu that says view options. If Zoom didn't default to doing it, you should be able to select side-by-side uh, -side mode, which will then give you my screen taking up a large portion of the left side of your screen, but you can still see either just me if you're in speaker view or many other friendly faces if you select gallery view off to the right of your screen. Uh, if you are an, on, on an iPad, there is unfortunately not such a good way to see both the presentation and everybody who is participating, but if you need to at least take me off of the screen so that you can actually see the presentation, there should be a little circle around a minus sign up to my upper right. Uh, I'm not really sure. The, the screen mirroring makes me not very sure if I'm pointing right or left, but it should be to the upper right little minus screen around, with a circle around it. If you tap on that, I, I should go away visually, but you should still be able to hear me. So we're all good on being able to see me uh, 
from the uh, PowerPoint presentation. I have you all set up on a second screen so that I can see you. So if you are waving or thumbs upping or any of that, I can still see you. <laughs> okay. Welcome and Chag Sameach. As I was mentioning briefly, Shavuot has always been one of my favorite holidays. And by always, I really only mean since I was about 14 or 15 when I first learned that it existed, um, because it is, as I had mentioned before, often a holiday that falls after the close of our religious school year. And so growing up, I didn't always learn as much about it. Uh, I knew that it happened in the spring. I vaguely knew what counting the Omer was, that period that we just finished counting from Passover to Shavuot to tonight, um, but not as much about what this holiday was about. So we are going to tonight be taking two tablets and we will be doing it in twofold. We will, there will be two layers of two tablets here. So come with me on this. The first layer of the two tablets will be what are these tablets? What is Shavuot? And then looking at the two tablets themselves of the Ten Commandments and then breaking the Ten Commandments down into its own version of two tablets. Uh, so for some, the overview of what Shavuot is may be new and may not be. I figured it was useful to offer it since, again, it's one of our lesser known of our three major pilgrimage festivals. So the, we have in the Torah, they're referred to as the regalim, the festivals that we walk or we take a journey to the, to the temple of old was the idea with them. And regal meaning leg, with the regalim were these journeying holidays, or as we often call them in English, the pilgrimage festivals. And they are Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. I put them in that order because that is the order in which they would go in the calendar as the Torah describes. The Torah describes in the month of Nisan where Passover took place as the first month. It wasn't until later that we started considering Tishrei, the month when we have Rosh Hashanah, the first month of the Hebrew calendar. So that is why I have Passover, Shavuot, Sukkot, rather than Sukkot, Passover, Shavuot. Uh, so clarification on that. And two of those three, we have a lot about. We know that they have a lot of ritual and they have a lot of um, commemoration and all three of them, there's this layered question, is the festival about a harvest uh, in an, an agricultural society of old or is it about layering in the story of the Jewish people? And as is so often the truth, it's both. So the Passover festival, when it comes to harvest, is commemoration of the wheat festival. Shavuot was the barley festival. This is why some communities have the custom of reading the Book of Ruth on Shavuot, because the Book of Ruth has uh, descriptions of the barley harvest. And then Sukkot, when we would harvest the rest of our fruits and other autumnal crops. I think Sukkot is the one where we are most aware of the harvest history still. Um, but all three of them actually had it. And we have layered in, in order, a way for all three of them to tell and retell our communal story each year. And starting with Passover, when we become a people who have been removed from bondage through the exodus of Egypt. And then what we celebrate tonight is the revelation, whatever that looked like, receiving of some kind of Torah at Mount Sinai in the Torah itself, described as giving of the Ten Commandments. And then on Sukkot, we commemorate the idea of wandering in the desert after we received the commandments, but before the people eventually reached the land of Israel, that constant wandering when we surrender to the elements around us and exist in our Sukkot, in our booths. So two of those, like I said, have a very clear ritual attached to them. I could probably ask if you want to throw in the chat, you could, what do we do for Passover? We have a Seder, we eat matzah, we tell the story. What do we do for Sukkot? We build a sukkah, we dwell in the sukkah, we eat our meals in the sukkah, we shake our lulav and etrog. There are very clear rituals that are attached to these two that are very recognizable and very tangible. And Shavuot, it's less there, it's less clear. It's actually not even so clear that Shavuot would have originally been meant to commemorate the revelation, something that gets layered in um, because we just see a couple of times where Shavuot in Deuteronomy is referred to being in a place that God would show us. And so the later rabbi says being in a place that, that God would show us must mean that was giving the Torah. 
So here are the two rituals that are the most common the two Shavuot, the two most common traditions. One is delicious unless you're lactose intolerant, in which case it's still delicious, but maybe not so pleasant later, um, where we, many of us have delicious dairy desserts. And this is one of those customs that is so old, no one really exactly knows where. I was trying to find some explanations for it. And some of them were a little far-fetched and some of them uh, were a little more beautiful. So I've collected a few that I thought were interesting to bring. Uh, the one that I felt was a little bit pushing it, but if Torah was given on Shavuot, we had all of the details, including the rules of Kashrut, which were developed in their specific senses much later. But if we assume that Torah was everything, the Torah given at Mount Sinai was everything about Judaism, then the Jews there would have, the Israelites there would have realized that the meat that they had with them may not have been kosher. And so they would have dairy meals instead. That's one of the explanations I have seen. I don't know how, I, uh, how much I agree with it, but it's there. Another is that the Torah teaches restraint and meat is seen in, as an indulgence. So we refrain from meat. Um, I think today our decadent cheesecakes may be just as much of an indulgence as a piece of fried chicken. So again, could be there. <laughs> Another points to a verse in the Song of Songs, that honey and milk shall be under your tongue, that milk and dairy is a sign of sweetness and Torah is sweet. And an explanation I heard recently uh, from Rabbi Adam Greenwald um, in Los Angeles was that Torah is as though it's the milk for a new people, that we were born as a cohesive people and Torah was our first nourishment. Um, so that was an explanation for dairy that I found lovely and moving and so I thought I would bring that. But overall, have something dairy and delicious tonight uh, is one of the traditions for Shavuot. The other, which is probably the one I have heard most and seen most actually, and is actually much younger, is the Tikkun Leil Shavuot, the affixment of the evening of Shavuot, where Jews will stay up either late into the night or all night and learn Torah to prepare themselves to receive Torah or hear the Ten Commandment in the morning. Uh, this came about, as noted, in the 13th and 14th century among the Lurianist Kabbalists in Spain, um, where they had the moment of staying up all night to perhaps create a receptive state for their Torah, perhaps awaken themselves to Torah they missed before, or because they simply thought revelation had happened at midnight. It is also worth noting that the 13th, 14th centuries ish was about when the coffee bean was introduced in Europe from the Americas. So you develop a tradition of staying up all night around when you get coffee. Okay. <laughs> so what are, we what are we celebrating getting? What was given? We say Torah, but what could that mean? Uh, uh, so now we're going to kind of go to the second tablet of the night. The first tablet being what was Shavuot. The second tablet is what, what is it? What are we getting? What is Torah? And it really can be anything in, anywhere in between these two extremes. It can be the exact text, and by text I mean texts, of the Ten Commandments. Uh, the text is ever so slightly different uh, when you see it in Exodus chapter 20 versus in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Uh, so if you... Um, if you were to look closely and you have a copy of a chumash at home, you could look closely at the differences between the two. And some say that Torah is every thought or teaching, that should say or, I apologize, any Jew has ever had when engaging in any kind of Jewish learning or really Jewish interaction or ritual, including what we are doing right now, that this too is a part of Torah. So that everything we do as Jews is a part of our Torah, our texts, our traditions, or our community. And so perhaps I saw one said one rabbi said the Torah the Ten Commandments are almost a table of contents of the Torah or another said perhaps it is a cataclysm sentence for everything we might call a Torah. So I want to explore some sentence for a moment. Um, in April, the episode of the podcast Radio Lab explored the concept of a cataclysm sentence, which I thought would be very interesting to explore for Judaism and for Torah. So one day in 1961, the famous physicist Richard Feynman stepped in front of a Caltech lecture hall and posed this question to a group of undergraduate students. 
If there were to be some kind of cataclysm and all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence was passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? So I wanna take a moment and invite you into the chat. And if you could think for a moment, what do you think might be the cataclysm sentence for the Torah? And I do say for the Torah rather than of the Torah. Don't think that it needs to be a verse. You don't need to have memorized anything in particular. It could be a verse, but it doesn't have to be. What is the one thing that is the cataclysm for the Torah or for Judaism as a whole? The first law of thermodynamics. I'm seeing in the in the text in the chat. <laughs> Love thy neighbor from Zan Fox. That which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. Both on the uh, so we have a Rabbi Akiva there with with Dan Fox, and we have Hillel there from Tori. Um, Kaylee says Shema Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Uh, Hillel said, Do unto others. And we have welcoming the stranger. So we've got a few, many of which I think completely, absolutely work and make sense. And I think the, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor and loving thy neighbor, those two mushed together, I think are a huge part of it. And perhaps Shema was one I hadn't thought to include, but also in there. But all of this welcoming and caring for one another and noting God and go study Torah. Thank you. So let's explore, because I think all of these Maybe they're not the thermodynamics. We'll have to talk about that later, Bernie, and see if we can get that one in there too. Um, but I think all of these are actually wrapped up in our Ten Commandments. I've only noted one of them explicitly in my presentation, but I think all of them are here. Ah, he says that was, that was, okay. <laughs> so yeah, there, right there, that's all of them? Okay, no. <laughs> so this year is the, all of the Ten Commandments, right? Very quick summary. It's certainly less than the entire Torah and the entire five books of Moses in a scroll. On the left-hand side, you see a, an image or rendering of what the, those would look like in the Torah scroll. On the right, you see the translation of the Exodus version um, of the Ten Commandments. And again, I noted that Exodus and Deuteronomy have ever so slightly uh, different version of the Ten Commandments. But Okay, so there it is as a, as a whole. Let's narrow it down to the two tablet summary that we often see it is. There it is, beautifully represented on two tablets. Um, noting that the, uh, the tablets are arranged in the Hebrew order, so the first five are actually to the right, not to the left. So we have, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt as the rest. Do not make for yourself a graven image. Do not take God's name in vain. Remember the Shabbat and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness and do not covet. It is worth noting these are how the Jewish tradition lays out the 10. Um, there are a little bit, uh, there are variations uh, in different um, Christian and Catholic traditions. Um, and Rabbi Dennis has a beautiful sheet about that if you, wanted, if you uh, wanted to take a look at it. I'm sure he would be willing to share it with you. And I have a copy I could scan and send to you with his permission as well. Uh, but I'm going to focus on how the Jewish tradition generally breaks down our Ten Commandments. So here I have it laid out without the graphic and in an order we'd be more used to looking at and in a summary sense. I'm gonna invite us in the chat one more time and say, so if you were to break this group of 10 down further, what categories might you include? How, would you, how might you break it down and, how, and what kind of title of the categories might you give? Positive and negative. We do have many that are in positive and many that more more so and more than more in negative than positive here, but we do have that. They're not necessarily evenly divided. Any other ideas uh, affecting you and God and affecting you and other people? We have that. So I'm guessing, Cindy, so you can correct if I'm wrong. We have the you and God is up to three, maybe four and other people beginning at five. Um, 
Um, so it's an honor your neighbor can be with anyone. Uh, stuff we also have regarding God, regarding others, and regarding family. A fair question is number one, a commandment. Uh, the most common explanation to that that I've seen is that that is not necessarily a command, but rather the thing that starts this to become a contract that allows us to be to come together that this is us entering into a relationship with God. God is citing what God has done for us and asking for what we should do for God and is the kind of the um, the impetus for this contract. And in the Hebrew, we usually say that we call these the Aserat Hadibrot, the 10 statements rather than commandments. Commandments is usually the English um, that is ascribed to this and actually is part of why there are differences in how the 10 break down um, if you look at Jewish traditions and different Christian traditions. Um, so we have, I think the most common one I'm seeing is the things regarding God and the things regarding others. So I would say that that almost breaks evenly and beautifully into two tablets. And we, and it is important we say two tablets because here they are on two different tablets, but that's not how it looked in the Torah. <laughs> but in the Torah, it is described that Moses came down the mountain with two tablets and those two tablets Moses came to, came with are usually assumed to be these 10 commandments or statements. And generally they are represented as five on each of the two tablets. It's not really usually represented as four and six or even three and seven though these are much shorter you could probably fit them that way onto two tablets so i like to was trying to think about how do we look at this first set of five and the second set of five and i think that the first set of five offer a reminder that some of our relationships in life are vertical it is honor your mother and father that kind of throws off that this, this half is only about God, but your mother and father are the third, the second and third partners in creation of you specifically. If God is the creator of the world and of us as a people, we should not take God's name in vain to honor a vertical relationship with God. Shabbat is an acknowledgement of God creating the world. And then we honor our parents for their uh, part in creating us. And so those are all vertical relationships, a recognition that we, are not uh, individuals uh, created for nothing, that we have creators, that there was a world before us, that our parents were before us and offer us the opportunity to have been created. Uh, as James said, the mother and father create us. Right? God creates the world and created our parents through their parents and through their parents and through their parents. And so we honor our parents as a connection to God in that vertical sense. And then the other five, the latter five, recognize that human be as human beings we also exist with horizontal relationships we exist in a world where others are around us and others are equal to us that every human being is created in the image of god and that every human being deserves the opportunity to be allowed to live uh, and to exist as fully as possible that every relationship deserves to not be mixed in with something else uh, that doesn't belong in a sacred relationship. Every person deserves to maintain their dignity, their objects and their body as much as possible and that every person deserves to have their truth honored and respected. And so I think the 10th commandment is often the hardest one on the vertical relationship sense, but it acknowledges a very real uh, reality for a lot of us as human beings, coveting, and desiring, and notice that the commandment goes on. Uh, I, I neutralized the Hebrew a little bit. Um, it does in fact say, do not cover your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's house, your neighbor's servants or slaves, their animals or any of their possessions, anything that belongs to them, because it's an obsessive layering. If you covet your neighbor's uh, wife, you covet your neighbor's house, all of those things, you're layering in all of these ways you wish you were your neighbor rather than yourself. And so, Number 10 is a reminder to be who you are, to have also have an honoring re, uh, horizontal relationship inward too. Um, and to remember that you yourself are also a creation of your parents and a creation of God. Uh, so that the 10th becomes the reminder that you are also in that horizontal relationship. Another teaching one of my teachers pointed out, I'll just say is the, um, these, these five, work in a backwards order of 
how easy they are generally, or in a forwards order of how easy they are generally, most of us pretty good, fine, easy to not commit murder. Most of us are blessed to not be, to be able to not commit adultery. But then we start maybe wanting something that someone else has and maybe we could get away with taking it. Maybe no one will know that we, that we lied. And often all of those violations are because we didn't manage not to cover, covet something that our neighbor had. Uh, so 10 is simultaneously a reinforcement of the previous four, but it's also a reinforcement that we ourselves are uh, in relationship with ourselves. We have a horizontal relationship back to ourselves. So the two prescriptions, the two tablets I see of our two tablets are a reminder on the first side that some of our relationships are vertical and we have to honor those. We have to acknowledge and respect that there is something greater than you, than us. That the world was created before we were and our whole lives are a gift. And in summary, we should have humility. And on the second tablet, we also have to remember that some of our relationships are horizontal, that we must honor them, and that all human beings are divine and should be treated as such. And that part of honoring other human beings is honoring ourselves, being our authentic selves and allowing other people to do the same. In other words, having pride and allowing others to have pride in who they are. And to boil it down even further, as someone said already, I have two different versions of one sentence. I think rabbis are allowed to have multiple opinions on things. Um, that which is hateful to you, do not do unto others, as uh, I think Tori said, as did Alan. Um, that which is hateful to you, do not do unto others, which harkens back to love your neighbor as yourself in Leviticus. And is quoted in the Talmud on Shabbat, page 31a. Or another teaching that I have loved from Rabbi Nachman of Breslev that says, the day that you were born, was the day that God created, the dot, that God decided that the world could not exist without you. That both of these things are tied up in our Torah. That we care about others, we don't hurt others. Sometimes that other might be a part of ourselves we're trying to deny. Sometimes that other might be God. And often that other is simply another human being who was also created in the image of God. And so we do our best to be in service to our own lives and to the lives of others. And we have the whole in the whole Torah a reminder that if God created the whole world and God had the, uh, the uh, ability, as in Sanhedrin said, to use one cast, one mold, and cast all of us differently, that we are each an intentional gift uh, to this world. And so I think those are my two cataclysm sentences of the Torah. If any have thought of any others, please feel free to throw those in the chat as well. And I will say, this is of course being Shavuot. We could keep thinking on it for a moment. We could think on it for an hour, or frankly, we can keep thinking on it all night long. Uh, there are this year many opportunities for having Tikkun Leil Shavuot, for staying up all night uh, from our homes. <laughs> as we have lots of opportunities to do lots of things from our homes these days. Uh, one of which is being put together by the Reconstructionist Rabbinical Assembly. You see me looking because I am grabbing the links to put them in our chat, and then I will end the screen share in a moment. But uh, the Reconstructionist Rabbinical Assembly is offering one at this link. It will be on Facebook Live. I believe it may even have started already as a whole, but Rabbi Sandy will be on at nine o'clock this evening teaching about uh, Jonah and quarantine and how those are laid, tied together. Here's a schedule for that for this whole evening. Uh, and there's another from our other uh, affiliated movement for our congregation put together by the Rabbinical Assembly of the Conservative Movement. They are beginning at nine o'clock uh, and their schedule is here with their link to their actual YouTube video at the top of that. Um, and they have a very long source packet if you'd like to download it and follow along with any of theirs. And theirs will be going from nine, p starting at 9 p.m. for us going to 9 a.m. So both of those are an option or you don't have to stay up all night. Again, the uh, revelation may have only taken place uh, at midnight. So stay up and enjoy as long as you would like to and do some Torah learning and gathering. And we look forward to seeing you for our morning service at 10 o'clock for our Yisker and uh, a little bit of 
Shavuot time together as a community again on Zoom. So Chag Sameach and thank you for learning with me. We can, uh, I think we can take everybody off mute and say Chag Sameach. Anybody want to throw it? Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Very well. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Good to see everybody from all over. Chag Sameach. Yashay Kochech. Thank you. Well, now we're all together. Families in California. Yes. Wait, before we leave, do we want to do, uh, I was going to do candles and kiddush to launch us together. I realize I have them right here. I had to re-angle my room a little. So. In order to truly launch us into our chag, let us do our chag candles. Cat is knocking at the door. I apologize for the noise behind me. <laughs> Wants to help. Yes, tonight. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohenu Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu Bemitzvotav Vitzivanu Lahadlik Ner Shel Yom Tov. Amen. And Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGafen. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bachar Banu Kol Ah, Verom Emanu Mikol Ashon, Vekishanu Ben Mitzvotav, Vatitain Lanu Adonai, Eloheinu Be'i Ahava, Moadim L'Simcha, Chagim Uzmanim L'Tlason, Et Yom Chag HaShavuot HaZeh, Zman matan toratinu mikra kodesh zecher litziat mitraim kivanu vacharta veotanu kidashta mikol hamim omoade kochecha besimcha besason hinchaltanu baruch atadonai mekadesh israel vehazmanim chayim shalom chayim chag sameach Look forward to seeing you in the morning. And of course, our six o'clock uh, Zoom uh, Shabbat tomorrow as well. And uh, we will be here and enjoying and celebrating together. And Chag uh, Sameach and enjoy uh, thinking on the learning we've done and or uh, jumping on any more learning that will be happening tonight. There will be all over everywhere tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.